thing that comes to mind is, oh no, what, what can we do? Why? Why? I was here for the total horror that was felt and expressed at the time. And outside the arcade each morning, the local drugs of choice, solvents and lubricants. We had an enormous epidemic of suicide of youth. The death certificates coldly codify the toll of this awful year. It seemed like there was one suicide every month. Then came the realization that a lot of our children were experiencing sexual abuse. Every single family was touched. It was total darkness at the time. And the scene in POV was no different than any other northern community. Even the land turned its back on its inhabitants. In many areas of the eastern Arctic, caribou, fish, and berries, once abundant, began to disappear. For a people already living on the edge, the situation was perilous. People were depressed, actually. We were sort of lost in a way. Looks like our community was cursed. While it appeared to some that God had abandoned Angwa Tizawak's descendants, in truth, God was the one seeking to reestablish the relationship. Just 60 years after God revealed his glory to Angwa Tizawak, he sent a second emissary to the Eastern Arctic. And this one had a name. Canon John Turner. He got this Bible when he was at college. The notes John Turner left in his Bible are revealing. Except a man forsake all, underline, that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Turner began his ministry among the Inuit in the late 1920s. In God's providence, his assignment took him to the very shores where Anguatizawak had led his people into a new covenant. Only two institutions preceded Turner's arrival in Pond Inlet. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Hudson's Bay Company. But the tiny community would become an important spiritual beachhead. Joan Hobart was living in John Turner's hometown in England when she first met him. He was home on furlough and spoke at her church. His stories of the Arctic were riveting. As a young Bible student, Joan was in awe of this man of God. My friend said, I think, I think he's interested in you. I said, oh no, he's... A He's a well-seasoned missionary, you know. But he was interested. He said, will you come and join life up there? And I said, yes. But the missions board said no. Arctic living was too harsh and no place for a woman. John went back without her. Joan would wait in faith. Three years passed without a single letter from the North. Then one day, a telegram. Permission granted. Bring ring, cake, and wedding dress. The trip was dangerous. The world was at war. German U-boats were patrolling the North Atlantic. The last leg of the two-month journey was aboard a supply steamer called the Nascope. The vessel stopped only once each year to offload food and mail. It was a long journey to the middle of nowhere all based on a single telegram and a lot of faith. I was a bit nervous because I thought, now suppose he comes and doesn't really want me. And so I went downstairs into the saloon. I said, well, I think I'll marry the first one, the first man that comes aboard. So fortunately, Jack came in a little rowboat and came and found me. So I think it turned out all right. She and Jack, as she called him, were married that afternoon. They spent their honeymoon in an igloo they built together. As a newlywed, Joan learned how to use a coal stove, how to melt ice to make water, and how to make a home at 40 below. I had to learn how to cook seal. I wasn't good at it at the beginning. <laughs> oh, dear. Childbirth and medical care were strictly home style, for the nearest hospital was too far. John Turner's love for the Inuit is clearly seen in his personal movies. And the love was reciprocated. Here was an Angelo who wore the ways of the North like a second skin. 
Local elders say he became more Inuit than the Inuit. He learned their language and translated the scriptures. He taught school using the Bible as his text. Most remarkable of all were John Turner's epic missionary expeditions. Traveling by sledge and often alone, he scattered spiritual seed across a parish larger than most nations. A seven-month journey in the winter of 1938 to 39 covered an astonishing 3,000 miles. Turner's church in Pond Inlet was the first of its kind, a vibrant ministry that continues to the present day. Every day was special to her because that's the first time she had known about Bible and prayer. Lydia was a little girl when Canon John Turner taught her the gospel. Fifty years later, the precious truths still bubble up in song. Cornelius Newtagak grew up with memories of a coming glory. John used to say to us, there's a life after death. It is very beautiful and it's called heaven. Turner was God's man in the Arctic, but the heaven he preached of was not so far away. The gun went off and he fell back. Arriving home from a hunting trip, he saw a child struggling with a heavy load of ice. As he bent down to help, his shotgun slid off his shoulder and fired. It went up here into the back of his head. The effort to get Turner to a hospital made international headlines. Soldiers parachuted in with medicine to stabilize the badly wounded minister. As paralysis set in, Joan was John's nurse day and night, bathing him, turning him, giving injections. She had two toddlers and was nearly eight months pregnant. It would be weeks before the ice could support the landing of a rescue plane. The restless and hungry soldiers were now added to Joan's burden. I went into Jack and I said, oh, I just can't do this anymore. I'm so tired. And I began to cry, I think. And he said, well, they are my guests. We must do what we can for them. When John Turner had nothing left to give, he gave a little more. Weeping Inuit besieged the Turners as they set out for the frozen lake. Although John could barely speak, he led them in prayer. Shortly thereafter, Canon John Turner died in a Winnipeg hospital. Three weeks after his funeral, his third daughter was born. Joan named her Faith I found my dad's Bible the other day in my mum's bookshelf. And, um, Although Faith I never met her father, he is no stranger. Book. I just was flipping through it and I, I, I came across this that he'd written at the back. And I determined henceforth I would seek no appropriation but that of God. Did I ever start on a life of happiness and holiness? But from that day until now, I've been content to live alone with God. And I just saw in it what my father's heart was like to just, you know, go off to what God has spoken to him. John Turner died long before he went to the Arctic. He knew that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That was his vision. Joan has seen it too. I had a vision once of all the young people coming through the streets, singing hymns and things. It, oh, in a vision, it will work one day. Yeah, it will come to pass. Like many in the Pond Inlet community, James Ariak sees himself as a spiritual descendant of Angutizawak and a spiritual disciple of John Turner. The planting of the word occurred into our parents. And our parents, through the planting of the seed, bore fruit. Back in February 1996, something happened. Throughout Pond Inlet, small groups of intercessors were pounding heaven with prayers for revival. Providing inspiration for this assault were two men with big hearts and worn-out knees. 
Arctic evangelist Billy Arnacook and local pastor Moses Kayak. That's when the people were convicted and were drawn uh, to the Lord in a great numbers. And uh, they were so convicted that they, had to, they felt they had to clean their houses. The dirt paths leading to John Turner's old church were suddenly congested with desperate townspeople. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to get rid of their illicit drugs, pornography, and heavy metal music. It was coming in like a flood. We had a big can, garbage can, right in front of the altar every night. They kept filling it up and filling it up. Every night, they went to the dump and burned them up. After five nights, the town dump was full. As community leaders considered incinerating the remaining items, they received encouragement from an unlikely source, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had a bonfire uh, right about here where the iceberg is. The Mounties even provided logistical support. Five gallons. They said, we can even provide gas to burn up the junk. Nearly the entire community turned out for the burn. According to the RCMP, the value of illicit property destroyed during the revival was a staggering eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. It was a deep repentance. The Holy Spirit himself was speaking to the people. The whole community was completely transformed. The afterglow of this momentous occasion warmed hearts for months to come. But it also hinted at a fire yet unrealized. A fire so remarkable, it would be talked about half a world away. February 28th, it happened in the middle of winter, February 28th, 1999. Believers had gathered for a week of revival meetings at the Anglican Church. Hungry for God and troubled by new reports of community drug use, they decided to add a special Sunday afternoon youth service. Among those leading the meeting were Pastor Moses Kayak and his ministerial colleagues Joshua and James Ariak all great-grandsons of the original lightkeeper, Angwatizawak. An invitation was offered for youth who felt they wanted to come closer to God. Worship leader Louis Ariak was praying over the youth that had gathered around the altar. I felt so close to God and he kept giving me this verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Something started to happen that uh, was out of our control. This noise started coming. Yeah, it's